This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast, episode nine. Today, Sean and I are here with Carrie Kessler, and we are going to be talking about Feminism 101, the roots and foundations for the gender movement. And as Sean and I have been working on the podcast and since the podcast started, we've realized that we've really needed to brush up on our feminist theory and really understand the foundation of feminism for the trans movement. And we wanted to have a conversation that really kind of lays the groundwork for all of us to sort of have a starting point to talk about feminism. And so we're just going to sort of cover the nuts and bolts today and really excited to have Carrie here today. Carrie is one of the people I've known the longest in Seattle. So this is very exciting for me to have Carrie on. So Carrie, welcome to the podcast. Do you want to give us a little bit about your history education wise and just sort of let us know why we might ask you to be the one to come and talk about feminism today. Sure. All right. Well, thanks for having me on, you guys. Super fun to be here. So I have a master's degree in women's studies that I got from Texas Woman's University, and I have taught gender and sexuality and queer studies courses at a couple of different universities in Oregon and also in Texas. And I think that's why you asked me to be here today. <laughs> um, I also work for public health and do um, sexuality health education for the health department. And so I stay up to date a little bit in that way as well. And that's here in Seattle. That's here in Seattle. Yeah, I've been there for about seven years. Tell us a little bit about your gender identity and just where you're coming from in terms of that. Sure. Yeah. Well, I identify as a female. Others sometimes identify me as femme, although I don't particularly identify that way myself. I am a lesbian. My partner definitely falls on the masculine spectrum, uses female pronoun, is very involved in the Butch Voices Conference, just to give you an idea of sort of where she's coming from. So it's a little bit about me. So the book that Sean and I were looking at, and we'll post a link to this, to just kind of get ourselves brushed up on feminism, is we read Judith Lorber's Gender Inequality, Feminist Theories and Politics, and, you know, kind of looked at that just to provide us a little bit of structure today, not that we'll adhere to it, but I feel like it gave us a good overview of feminism and I sure did go out and buy this book right after the last Butch Voices conference <laughs> I went to <laughs> and Carrie was there and had some interesting conversation around how I subscribe to the patriarchy because I use male language to describe myself words like daddy that was not what I said <laughs> <laughs> no that wasn't what you said for sure <laughs> No, you were following me into the other room when I was about to cry. No, I'll take that <laughs> out. <laughs> I was so upset. Anyway, I was actually really excited to have Carrie on the show as well because, especially lately, having seen a few films like Boy I Am, as well as coming across some blog posts in regards to commentary by trans individuals that felt either attacked by old school feminist members now, and basically the discussion that started to enter my mind as to how to be a good feminist and own my female body history, but also be a trans man. So I think we'll just go ahead and get started. We're going to start at the beginning and Carrie's going to take us through the waves of feminism and we're going to start with gender reform feminisms. I think I just want to say before we get started that I'm so glad that you guys are doing this episode. It's so important and I feel like it comes up in spaces that I'm in all the time where people are having these conversations about what it means to be trans or masculine identified and not feel like you're subscribing to the patriarchy or how to do masculinity without being a misogynistic asshole. How do you work that out? I hear people in my own life having this discussion and I read these same discussions. So I think it's a really relevant topic and something that people are already talking about, whether they're explicitly calling it feminism or not. So I think it's very smart of you guys to address it proactively. Well, thank you for being here and agreeing yeah. to talk about it. So I can try and walk us a little bit through some of the waves of feminist history some people even sort of take issue with the whole concept of calling them waves, but it is, I think, a useful way to look retrospectively at the feminist movement and see it in sort of um, a couple of large clumps, really, and okay. some of what the goals have been and why they have been. They've been, of course, very situated in the time and place that they were at, very contextual as any movement is. So the first wave, as it's called, feminism, is really the movement that happened in the late 
1800s and early 1900s. Some people trace it back even further. And I'm going to be talking primarily about feminism in the United States here, which we can talk later about what flaws there might be in that analysis. But that is the analysis we're probably going to use um, along with some European influence, right? So the first wave of feminism around the turn of the century was primarily focused on the vote, on getting the vote. And we would understand it as sort of a liberal feminism is mostly what we would call it today. It was primarily interested in material gains. People were interested in getting the vote and in being able to own property and pass property on and inheritance rights and things that had to do with marriage, right? There just was a lot of inequality. And that was what the first wave primarily focused on. There was also sort of a, a second thing going on at the same time, which had to do with some of the early family planning history came out at that time. So Margaret Sanger and the early Planned Parenthood work happened at that time. It was illegal to talk about birth control, especially you couldn't send anything in the mail. So there was sort of a rights to your own body kind of thing that was happening at the same time that often is sort of overlooked. It's told when you talk about the history of birth control, but it doesn't get talked about as much in the history of feminism for some reason, right? And originally, it was also rooted in a larger movement in the beginning, in the abolitionist movement, right, which was happening at the same time. And then there was a, a splintering of sorts where the abolitionist movement and the feminist movement split apart. They had originally been working hand in hand. They had seen their causes as linked. And then for a variety of reasons, those movements split. And most people would say that those reasons had primarily to do with racism, that white, well-educated women saw that they were much more likely to be able to get the vote for themselves than they were to work with poor, uneducated black women and try and get the vote for them at the same time. Wow. So opportunism, <laughs> racism. Um, and I think it's important to mention it because it is a legacy that plagues feminism really throughout. And so it's important to really speak about it, I think, right up front. And what time period was that? Um, when did the split happen, you yeah. mean? When did that split happen? Probably late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. And I don't know that there was a, I mean, there wasn't like a memo. Do you know what I mean? Right. So there were certainly women who continued to be active in the abolitionist movement. But as you look back at it historically, you can see that there started to be separate conferences and things started to be handled a little separately. Mm, what else do I want to say? So the other thing sort of <clears throat> philosophically or theoretically to know about the um, first wave of the feminist movement was that um, it was sort of posited upon this theory of difference, right? So that women's, uh, because they had to make a claim, right, about why they should have the vote, about why they should be allowed in the public sphere at all, because they were completely relegated really to the private sphere, to the domestic sphere. Um, and and their, one of their main arguments which you'll see, which is why I think we should mention it, you'll see it over and over again, is that there were special and unique ways in which women were different and that that qualified them to make a meaningful and different, a unique contribution, right? So that because of women's um, <clears throat> domesticity, because of their maternalness, because of their nurturing, because of their whatever, right? That that wouldn't that be a lovely thing to have in the public sphere? Shouldn't they let women in for that reason, right? And this is another thing that we'll see um, as a thread that runs throughout feminist history is this um, is sometimes positing women as different and superior in some ways and other times positing women as just like men, right? They're two different right. arguments. And as we move forward and get into later feminisms, there will be people who try to disrupt that whole notion. But just so you know, that's sort of what was going on in the first wave. I definitely read about that. Yeah. Um... I think that's all I want to say about the first wave, unless did you guys have any questions or was there something um, you had read about that you wanted me to touch on? Do you want to cover anything about, because Marxist, the Marxist stuff was called out. Should I be talking to Mike? Probably not. If you want to. <laughs> well, so the Marxist, the, the, I guess the Marxist, as that is part of the first wave of feminism, I feel like is talked about a lot and also referenced a lot. I've heard it brought up in conversation and just had um, people circle back to that. So I don't, I, it's definitely part of the first wave of feminism, but I don't think I would understand necessarily what that, what it means to be a Marxist feminist. Right. What does that mean? Well, in, gen in, a, in a broad brush way, both the Marxist and the socialist feminists, although 
some ways it's confusing because the Marxist feminists went on in some ways to sort of morph into the socialist feminists, but okay. their um, liberal feminists always are kind of concerned with um, gain, political gain and gain and what we might think of as sort of the real world, right? Um, access to privileges and power that men have in a general way, right? Marxist and socialist feminists situate their analysis in the labor sphere. So what they said were things, very interesting and compelling arguments, I think, actually. They said that, um, that, and as it gets into the second wave, it's much more about capitalism. But in general, they said, look, there is a whole domestic sphere of labor that is completely overlooked, right? And our labor supports this other sphere. And so it deserves to be recognized and paid and valued and right so they looked at it in terms of um a, in terms of a division of labor which i think is an interesting way to look at it so does that does that partly set the tone for conversations that i feel like you you hear more so later on when women are essentially doing two jobs that they are fulfilling the whole full-time job of being the you know the primary caregiver the primary parent and then actually in the workforce working too and that that second job is completely overlooked and not yeah, no, I think absolutely. And what they would say is regardless of whether you had paid employment or not, that there that, that is labor. And once you get into talking about capitalism, what they say is that the whole capital system, capitalist system rests upon that unpaid and unrecognized yeah. labor of people, of women in the domestic sphere. Right. And right. that it's other oppressed groups, marginalized groups of, um, you know, at, at the intersection of race, class, all of that, that you primarily wind up doing that work. Well, and once you get into later analysis, <laughs> that's what they would say. But at this time, I don't think they would. Okay. At this time, I don't think they would say that, which is ironic, and, right, because it would have been a perfect mesh with the abolitionist movement because there right. was actual slavery at the time, right? Right. right. Which is why. <laughs> Labor upon which the capitalist system rests, right? Right. Yeah. So the only other thing I'm – you, did you have something? Is it? Okay. The only other thing I'm thinking about, too, here is that – the binary existed long before this, but it, it does seem like to rally and to have a movement, to build a movement that the women, that, fem, that these women had to organize themselves under the category of woman. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, our feminist movement has fed the binary too. I mean, I think we talk about it differently now, but mm -hmm. I, I think that tone was set then too. Oh, of course it was. Yeah, it absolutely was, right? Because uh, I mean, the binary was already there. Do you know what I mean? And it was, and what has happened with this whole, like, we are just like men or we are, or we have something unique that men don't have. Obviously, it reifies the binary and what they were trying to do was use it to their own advantage, really, you know. Um, <clears throat> but no, there was not a lot of thought about the difference and no attention paid to the intersection, right? So, um, of race and class and gender, just almost no attention paid to it at all. And um, I think, in the, in the first wave somewhat more and more in the second wave, the other thing that um, I think is so startling is the, um, the belief that and the um, assertion that gender, that sexism <clears throat> is the primary oppression, the primary organizing oppression, right? And that is a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's a very big deal and it really colors things. Um, and although I don't, I don't know, I don't know my first wave history well enough to know if people were saying that out loud so much, but it was definitely reflected in their actions. It also, though, was totally revolutionary. I mean, it wasn't just that they were fighting for the vote. I mean, standing, picketing, some of their tactics, they had, they had good tactics, right? They had some pretty good um um, organizing approaches and just doing that, just the mere presence of women standing on the street with picket signs was un was shocking and revolutionary unheard of, and unheard yeah. of. They had to come out of the private sphere in order to, to agitate for their right to come out of the private sphere. So, I mean, you just have to understand how, how really revolutionary that was. It was a very big deal, right? I mean, it's easy, I think, to point out the flaws in retrospect, um, but I think it would be folly not to recognize the enormity well, of what right. they did. And they were already the ones stuck at home. So, I mean, I, I feel like they were already organized that way anyway. Yeah, I mean, they must have. <laughs> they must have. I always think that they run like a babysitting co-op too, like who took care of their kids right. while they were, you know. Yeah. I mean, it, it's sort of amazing, right? Yeah. 
so that is the that's the first wave right and then if you believe that waves theory not a lot happened for a while <laughs> which seems <laughs> unlikely really right am i okay am i loud enough um and then the second wave came along and the second wave was really um different in the sense that it was really couched in there was a lot of organizing going on when the second wave came along um in the 60s there were there it was just a huge time of um organizing and agitating right so the feminist movement was um sort of relaunched or whatever in the context of anti-capitalism movements and anti-war movements and the, uh, the beginnings of the gay and lesbian rights movement and the whole civil rights movement, right? I mean, it was, there was a lot going on and a lot to borrow from and a huge um, community for people to be a part of. And it's actually part of what happened in the feminist movement was that, um, at least for women of color who were trying to join in um, you know, some of the civil rights struggles, what they found was clearly the intersection, right? What they found was that as they tried to um, work in civil rights movements, that sexism relegated them to, you know, being the secretaries of that movement, right? Mm. Which they were uninterested in. They then tried to sort of join in the um, feminist movement and found themselves marginalized by their race mm. in the feminist movement. And so you can really see um, the beginnings of some of the third wave already right there, right? So, <coughs> that's okay. Um, so, what do I want to say about the second wave? So, um, the second wave of feminism, I think, was, ca was characterized by a lot of organizing and consciousness raising. There was the general belief that women could and should um, empower each other, right? That women should work together to support each other, to raise each other's awareness so that if you had people who didn't understand their oppression, that they could come join your consciousness raising group and, um, you know, uncover, you know, understand better the things that were happening to them and happening around them. Um, there also, I think, the second wave people remember in the second wave, um, some of the lesbian feminism and the radical feminism, which is not, and, and the liberal feminism. I mean, in general, I would say those three stands people really remember the most. And liberal feminism is really characterized by, like, um, National Organization for Women, right, um, who did a lot of really good work and made a lot of gains in the political and the corporate spheres, which is where liberal feminism tends to be, again, just like in the first wave, really concerned with I don't want to say material gains, but like actual measurable, concrete, real world kind of stuff, right? But liberal feminists are also the ones who will most strongly assert that um, sexism is the oppression, the primary oppression. They're the ones who really go there the most, I think. Um, so there was there was a national organization of women. Now was founded at that time. Did a ton of work. Also tons of reproductive rights stuff going on obviously in the second wave it's when the birth control pill came out and there was a whole sexual revolution and so there was a lot um Roe v. wade was passed i mean it's just a ton of stuff around um women's bodies and the whole concept of women's bodies figures really prominently in the second wave for in a variety of different ways so in the liberal feminism it focused around the concrete gains things like access to abortion and access to birth control pills right um, in radical feminism, radical feminists, and I say radical, we use the word radical now and we think that it means like something that's really out there. The real meaning of the word radical is to get to the root of something, right? So radical feminists, liberal feminists were interested in modifying an existing system so that it was more equitable for women, right? Radical feminists were interested in completely dismantling and recreating the system as you would expect from that word, right? And radical feminists really posited women's bodies as the central site of that struggle in a lot of ways. They sort of imagined women's bodies to be the core, the core organizing point, if you will, right? And that, the, that oppression was occurring around. That oppression was occurring around and from which power could be gained also, right? So um, radical feminists, um, many of them, so their idea was that everything 
is rooted in patriarchy. There is no thing that is not patriarchal in this society, right? And can you, just for the purposes of us having common language, can you define what patriarchy would mean? Yeah, I mean, patriarchy is the, the organizing of things such that um, man and maleness is, um, is normal and superior and such that um, knowledge and power and goods are passed from man to man and that men and maleness are the, are the um, axis upon around which things are organized. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So they said, forget it. It's all patriarchy. You can't do anything. You can't go to the bank because the whole concept of the way the bank is structured, patriarchy. It's all, right? Because it's all men who did it. And it's all, it's all, patriarchy is like the water that we swim in as fish, right? So everything that we do is steeped in it. We're, we're so immersed in it that we should just get out of it, right? So like the race equivalent would be white privilege. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So in the way that the dominant category always right. is both superior and invisible, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So... <laughs> So, um, so, so radical um, feminists who are also always often um, separatists said women should get off on their own, and do their own deal, set up their own societies, and um, and just not have men for anything in any way, anywhere, and not participate in any of the institutions that were set up by men, which are all institutions that are already set up. Right. Just create a whole separate. Right. And so this gets back at what you were talking about in the beginning with things being equal. So with, with women are just the same as men. We should have all the same rights and stuff, but it's because mm -hmm. we're the, there's no difference. And mm -hmm. then this is the, this is really where we get into know it's, it's hugely different and everything that we have so far is based upon how men see the world or how men, how the world's been organized around men. And it, it's not about wanting that exact same thing. We want something completely different. So right. And I think, split. yeah. And I think also what they were saying yeah. is we don't even know what things would be like outside of the patriarchy. We can't even imagine what that world would be. We need to create that world, a world that is centered around um, women's power, women's way of knowing things, right? There's a lot of epistemological women's way of knowing stuff that came out of that time, right? Um, so, and and so many of them did that, and certainly lots of them um, strove for that in, in all sorts of ways. And I could see how, I just have to say something, <laughs> I could see how subscribing and owning the word woman and, and, the, and identifying as a woman mm -hmm. gets even more critical mm -hmm. at this point. It's, it, it's just so key. Yeah, oh, it's completely key, right? Because the idea is that men are the oppressors in every way against women, right? Um, so including, of course, sleeping with them, right? So there's also this push for um, what, what was called political lesbianism, right? Uh -huh. Which was like, it doesn't really matter if you are sexually attracted to a man or not. If you are sexually attracted to a man, it's only because you've been steeped in the patriarchy and it has caused you to find men attractive, right? So it doesn't matter if that's what you find attractive, you should not sleep with them because they are your oppressor, right? So you should have your sexual relationships with women because, you know, it's the whole women only deal. Right? Wow. Yeah. So this is this is lesbian feminism. Well, that it, in part. I mean, lesbian feminists, lots of lesbian feminists were le lesbian women who were genuinely sexually attracted to other women and who took on, I mean, whatever. It's not my deal to say who has lesbian identity and who doesn't. You know, I mean, that lesbian feminism is certainly intertwined with this. Right? Okay. Yeah. Well, I have a quick question around stuff. Well, I know it's going to be relevant. It might be. So... This is my loose understanding, but wasn't the butch femme movement kind of coming around at this time as well? So how did a new radical slash lesbian political entity justify, you know, the butch femme dynamic that started to evolve in lesbian societies? It's such a good question. Um, it did not. It did not. Right. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> Right? No, there was huge pushback. So so also within that movement, there was a lot of 
a lot of pressure about how then to be a lesbian, right? So, and the push was really towards, I don't know if androgyny is quite the right word, but you were not to be masculine because of the patriarchy and men being the oppressors, right? And you were not to be... You don't want to look like them. Right. Well, or or take on... It's not even just about looking like them, right? I mean, the whole concept of butchness is sort of like class. It's not just one thing. It's demarcated by a whole body of things, right? And so you're not trying to, to be like men, right? Was sort of the way it was understood um, at, at the time and, and in certain circles. Um, nor were you really trying to be too femme because that would just show that you had also bought into the patriarchy and there's all this stuff. I mean, in the, in the second wave, one of the, one of the huge markers, early markers in the second wave was a giant protest at the Miss America pageant, right? I mean, about the, about standards of beauty and the enforcement of beauty on women, right? It was great. It was fun, actually. They had a whole, I mean, I mean, it wasn't fun for everybody, but they set up like a whole second Miss America pageant nearby where they like crowned a sheep Miss America <laughs> and they did a whole thing right which is also an interesting point about the second wave is that borrowing from other movements especially some of the gay and lesbian movements of the time like Queer Nation and ACT UP that were happening there at the time things got a lot more theatrical I mean they really they, they got some new tactics right <laughs> which is great I mean that's great right <laughs> So, Want yeah. Study up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, they're good. They had it. They knew what they were doing, I think, at the time. So, um, so yeah. So, within the context of radical feminism, radical cultural feminism, we should say specifically, is kind of what we're talking about. Not fans, really, of the butch fan movement at all, right? Yeah. Okay. So, which obviously didn't stop it from happening. Right, I was gonna yeah. Say the time, like, you know, because that's where that's about the time that it started. So, it yeah. Mm-hmm. It's about the time that it that it came about in terms of being sort of like a movement. It's certainly not around that you know. It's not the time that it's been always sort of sort of butch and femme women. You know what I mean? But um, but yeah. Anyway, regardless, there are lots of good books about what it was like at that time and about the interesting and unfortunate, like. In the same way that there was all that pressure within the radical lesbian movement or radical feminist movement about how to be a lesbian, tons of pressure within the lesbian butch femme community about how to do relationship, right? So, and about who could date who and how to be butch and how to be femme and who, I mean, lots and lots of pressure at that same time too, right? So, and I, I feel like still we is. still have it now. Yeah, still yeah. yeah. Well, we do still have it, but we don't have it like that. Like there was. It. I mean, I'm not going to say there's not pressure. I'm certainly privy to it. You know what I mean? But, um, but it's not like it's. I mean, that some of the some of the stories that I read from women at that time are tragic. I mean, they're really they're very sad stories. So, um, it is it is possible to be out and gay and not be butch or femme now. You know what I mean? And it sure. was difficult then. You were butch or femme or you were sort of hippie, androgynous, lesbian, feminist. And you didn't have a lot of other space, you know? <laughs> so um, what else to say about the second wave? The second wave, I would also just say, is what? If you just say the word feminist or feminism, the second wave is what people think about, right? They think about women all that like burning your bra stuff or whatever primarily happened at that Miss America second pack, you know, the faux pageant or whatever, right? So, um, and the, you know, down with beauty ideals was when women were like, you know, fuck shaving your legs and all of that stuff. And, and now was so well recognized, people really, the second wave embodies that feminist movement for better or for worse, right? Um, Standpoint feminism is, that's interesting that it's written here. I sort of imagine standpoint feminism as coming from a different place. So I can see that standpoint feminism is, um, in this book, is categorized as coming during the second wave. And it it may just be my own ignorance that I don't understand it as coming from the second wave. My knowledge of standpoint feminism um, is, I guess it would be the second wave. It's definitely not the third wave. But I understand standpoint feminism to have primarily come out of women of color feminism right and particularly black feminist thought right so Patricia Hill Collins um, is a, um, a famous black feminist thought scholar and she um, I don't know if I would say she's the originator of standpoint theory but she certainly is one of the 
she's part of that canon, right? And certainly women of color feminisms did really start emerging during the second wave in a very big way. Audre Lorde is a part of the second wave and Gloria Anfaldua was, I mean, all of the, you know, all of the, the, the people who you imagine, you know, they came from there. So standpoint, feminist thought, really, I think, I think laid the, um, paved the way for the third wave more than anything else is what I would say, right? Sort of in between the two. Well, I, it, maybe it's in between the two, but it definitely, it was, it was a more significant shift because r radical feminism and um, liberal feminism and some of the other strands, we're still working on this difference concept, right? Uh, still deeply rooted in the binary, right? You are either, you are either or, either this or that, right? And, um, which is pretty obvious in, in radical feminism, right? You're either with us or you're in the patriarchy, right? right. Liberal feminists were said you're either, you know, in some Seems ways. very essentialist. It, it, it is very essentialist, right? Um, it's also can be a very useful organizing tool. It can serve you very nicely for to get gains that you're looking for, right? And if you really want to posit that you are not this other thing, it makes a lot of sense, except that every time you say what you're not, you're just giving power to the other thing that is. I mean, that's the problem with the binary. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Every Because every, I mean, many people would say that the whole category of woman, I mean, if you fully subscribe to the patriarchy, you would say that the whole category of woman really only exists to make the category of man mm -hmm. yeah. possible. Yeah, right. that woman is the other, right? right? What is woman? Not man. Right. That's what woman is, right? So, and psychoanalytic feminism theory would really say that men, that the category of woman, of other, is really just a category filled up of all the things that men don't particularly want to have. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> right? So you could then imagine pretty easily why people might want to reclaim. and I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? So, um, but it also is problematic and much clearer in retrospect. So, <laughs> so what standpoint theory says, and I'm a fan of standpoint theory, standpoint theory tends to be really rooted in people's lived experiences, which I think is probably a smart place to start, right, without privileging any one individual person's knowledge above another, right? But what it also says is that you, I mean, not to overly simplify it, but that the, from where, what you see is affected by where you stand. And it's really the basis for intersectionality, because what they're saying is, being a, you're not just a woman. Who, what is your standpoint? Are you a black woman? Are you a white woman? Are you a white lesbian woman? Are you a white poor woman? Are you, what, what, who are you exactly, right? Because those, all of those things inform what you see. And they also would say, especially as it, as it grows a little more, that you don't, um, that there is no one objective thing that we're all just seeing different pieces of, but that there are genuinely different things depending on where so you that stand. The foundation then for postmodern. I. It seems to me that it is, and I'm not. I mean, I don't want to. Certainly, other people might disagree, and other people might even disagree a little bit with my um, characterization of standpoint. But maybe because my understanding of standpoint grew at the same time as my understanding of postmodernism, it seemed that seemed really clear to me. But um, Bell Hooks and um, Patricia Hill Collins both are very much utilize the standpoint. Um, uh, theory or way of seeing things, and um, I, it, there's a lot that works so about it. It also seems like the first time we can try to etch out a little bit of the binary and try to see more of a fluidity. Too. Yeah. Well, that's what I that's what I say, and of course, it came from women of color who who said, "You don't. I have not. My my concerns have not been reflected." I mean, just as an example, it's so insulting, really. Do you know what I mean? I I give a lot of. Um, I mean, I cut people a lot of slack, right? Because I know it's much harder to have been there than it is to stand on the outside and criticize it. But, you know, uh, uh, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique in the second wave was this book about the difficulty of being an isolated woman in the domestic sphere, right? Which is no doubt very difficult, right? But a very specific concern, right? <laughs> this is not, at, it's a, it's a, it's a privileged white woman's concern, which is not to say that it's not a real concern and that women didn't lose their minds and become addicted to drugs and kill themselves over this situation. It's real, you know. But 
throughout history, you know, women of color have been working their asses off because no one would hire their men because everyone is afraid of their men. Do you know what I mean? And so they work and work and work and work and work, right? And then Betty Friedan comes along and says that, like, women's concern is how they don't get to work and they're just stuck at home doing nothing all day. I mean, that's insulting, right? right. That's insulting. So it's insulting to pretend like it's all women's concerns. It's not insulting for her to speak her truth, right? But for her to act like it's true for everyone is ridiculous, right? And so <laughs> it was out of – I mean, that's just one example. But out of – it was out of things like that that – um, not just that women of color started organizing, but that they started theorizing because they were like, in, in some ways, as a nod to the radical feminists, they said, right, it's all steeped in patriarchy and it's all steeped in whiteness mm -hmm. and it's all steeped in some of this other stuff. And we have a different standpoint that leads us to see different things. And it, just, it reminds me of having like one trans narrative as the trans narrative mm -hmm. and it's usually a white trans. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, and within the trans community, I mean, it's all, it's true in every community, but I, particularly within the trans community, there's such class stuff going on too. Like who can, who can afford to pass well, who can afford, I mean, it's a big deal, right? Yeah. So, um, so anyway, so out of that arose standpoint feminism, and I would say out of standpoint feminism in some ways arose postmodern theory, although postmodern theory, of course, isn't particularly about feminism. I mean, right. there's a whole huge body of postmodern yes. work started out of what, like linguistics, or I mean, postmodern theory. theory did, yeah. yeah, right. I mean, it didn't come from it didn't come from where we might have thought, right? It started in completely other places, and as a result, has a lot of focus on discourse, right? A huge focus on discourse in the third wave. So, so moving forward then to the third wave. And the third wave is sort of contentious, right? So the third wave uh, started in the, what, late 80s or something, right? 1980s until now. And, um, and the third wave is characterized by a few different things. It's characterized by um, reappropriation. There's a lot of reappropriation in third wave feminists. So third, the third wave feminist movement also had its roots in, like, um, punk girl culture right girl. riot right girl right with the r's right <laughs> <laughs> so but even but even there is the reappropriation right the, talk the, say a little bit more about what you mean by reappropriation right so the use of the word girl right the use of the word bitch right there's a magazine called bitch there's a book called cunt right there's people calling themselves girls right second wave feminists would die they are dying they can't believe it many of them right <laughs> Right, because it seems outrageous to them, and it seems um, slip, right? Just because people worked so hard against that, right? And so, so some second wave feminists critique the third wave movement by saying the only reason that you get to be so playful with those words is because we worked so hard to make a world for you where you were not so oppressed, right? And that is actually probably true, right? I mean, the the um, when I read a little bit about sort of the, um, the organizing principles for the third wave movement, because of course also again contextual, very contextual, right, that it's contextualized by a more equal playing field right. than was true before, very much more With equal, civil rights. yeah, so gains in civil rights, gains especially around the liberal feminist frontier, so that like although it's true that um, men, wealth is still concentrated and it's concentrated in the hands of men, if you take those rich men out of the picture and you look at men and women's pay, they're, it's pretty, there's parity by and large, right? So um, women are more likely than men to be getting degrees now. I mean, there are all these gain, gains in the liberal feminist frontier that have created more parity at the same time that there's been general economic downturn all since the 80s in a large part, right? And um, rapidly growing globalization. And all of those concerns, or um, maybe not concerns is the right word, but those factors, mm -hmm. factors. shape the, um, the third wave, right? So that they, they are more, um, they are able to reappropriate because some of the gains that have been made. And, um, and they're less likely, third wave folks in general, less likely to identify with the word feminist. But in part, it's because feminist struggles are more um, broadly spread, right? So they're more likely to be involved in um, um, sort of 
like the more like anti-globalization work and right so that there are so people are doing feminist work without knowing they're doing feminist there work. are a lot of that's what people would say people would certainly say that and that's basically based on the intersections that Yeah, it's it, it it has something to do with acknowledging the other part, certainly, right? And it has something to do that with the parity that exists now. You don't get to really say that um, that sexism is the primary oppression. Like, not only have we maybe learned that that's not true, it's also less tenable. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because women feel less oppressed now. Are women no longer oppressed? Of course they are. Of course they are, here and around the world. So it's not like sexism is gone, right? But all you have to do is turn on the TV. <laughs> right, right. Um, sexism is not gone, and, and sexist images and stereotypes are far from gone, right? But women feel much more confident and empowered and able to deal with them in a general way. And so it changes the struggle. And it moves more towards this postmodern too. So that so then postmodern feminism in general, which is part of the third wave, but a little different from the kind of riot girl sort of stuff, right? The whole idea of postmodern feminism is primarily to to not posit a primary oppression first of all, right? That they say it's not that race is the primary oppression or sexism or whatever, right? Because they say that's ridiculous because everyone has a race and a sex and a gender and a sexual orientation. So how could one of them be primary? You could never have one of those things without the other, right? You don't get to experience the world as just black. You're always black and male or female, black and male or female and rich or poor, right? You always are all of these things. And trans. Or, and trans and whatever, all of them, right? <laughs> you always have a gender. You always have a class. You always have a sexuality. And so one can't be primary because you're never just one, right? And that they don't, that they can't be added together, that it's not a zero sum game, that you don't, that it's not race plus class plus gender plus sexuality, that they combine, right? Like, I don't know if this is a, a, an overly simple analogy, but I remember an instructor saying that it's sort of like cooking. It's not like a salad where everything is still in there and has its own shape. It's like baking, where you put everything together and you come out with a whole new thing at the end. Do you know what I mean? And it's a whole, you're a whole new thing, so right? So it's cumulative, but different. Yeah. <laughs> it's cumulative and transformative, right? Yeah. That things come together. And, of course, what, what third wave feminists will tell you is that it also, which one is primary, if you will, would shifts from moment to moment. Because it's contextual. Yeah. Because it has to do with who you're around. Your race is more of an issue when you're around people who are a different race than you, right? right? Your gender is more noticeable in spaces where you don't match up with other people, right? right? right. So and it may be one thing in the workplace might wind up being more important versus something else. It's more of a, yeah. Yeah, sense. absolutely, right? So, um, and what um, the third wave in general postmodernism, poststructuralism would say is that the place to look at for resistance are sort of the cracks, not people's identities, right? So that in the second wave, there was a lot of sort of identity politics. And the third wave says identity politics can get you gains. You can get real gains, right? And we see that the whole concept of a protected class and an anti-harassment policy, for instance, very valuable, right? It's very valuable to have those listed out. There's also a lot of battle always about who is not listed there, who ought to be there, right? So, um, but in the third wave, they say, choosing and forming and sticking to those identities may not really be the way to gain you anything because in some ways you're reifying that binary you're always mm -hmm. you know you're always excluding someone you're always giving weight to the other half of that the more privileged half of it right and that to to really create change you want to look for sort of the the fissures they say the cracks in in between that stuff and that's the place to kind of get in and they give a lot of weight to, to discourse. They say words. There is no there is no reality that you describe with words. There are words that give meaning to the things in front of you. And so, mm. right? And so the, Episode the words one. <laughs> <laughs> So they say the words that you use are enormously important in the way that conversation goes. And that also speaks to the history of the postmodern movement and where it originated, right? Um, so I, mean, I, I think Especially with the trans movement, it's like language is, is defining and redefining it every yeah. day. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, and you can see, I mean, when you, when you look at the, at reclaiming language, you know what I mean? It makes a lot more sense in light of that. Right. So, um, and then the other thing, of course, that's really that postmodern feminism, the third wave, whatever, all these feminisms really start to have in common is the, the movement away from the binary, right? Which people are still really struggling with how to do, um, but to say we're not, you know, it's not, it's not either or, it's both and, right? It's, you know what I mean? You don't have to be either man or a woman. You could be both a man and a woman. You could be something other than that. You could be lots of things other than that. You could be whatever, right? And that, um, but, but it's, people are, it's a, it's a different mindset. Do you know what I mean? And folks are, some folks are still struggling to get their heads around what that means in the, in practical terms. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like bathrooms, like bathrooms, right? <laughs> right. Right. So, and that is the main critique of the um, postmodern way of looking at things is that it is a useful academic construct but that it ignores actual power differences, that it sort of lays an equal playing field. It says there are no real power differences. It's all just created by language, right? And people say, right, but. <laughs> this is what I experience <laughs> when I go. I, right, yeah. and so the task at hand, I think, because both of those things are true. I mean, not to be too third wave about it, but it is both and, right? <laughs> there are real power differences that people experience in the world that affect them, that affect their safety, that affect their livelihood, that have to be attended to, but they don't have to be attended to in, in with the binary, but how not to, how to do that. And that, I think, is where the real work is happening right now and where people are really thinking about how to apply the, the, the more fluid concepts and principles to people's lives and use them to better people's lives, not just to make people feel better about who they are, not just to have more accurate language. Both of those things, of course, are very valuable, but, um, but there is more to it than that. And so that, I think, is where the third, and I think the third wave is making gains there. But I mean, I would say I think that's where the so more to it, like access to resources, access to, you know, the things that I think people are discriminated. Right. Around. If you're going to have an anti-harassment policy and you don't have a list of protected classes, then people slip through the cracks. If you do have a list of protected classes, then you've fallen into some of the pitfalls of identity politics. Mm -hmm. So what is the other way? What are other ways? And I, I don't necessarily know what they are all the time, but that I think is where the where the struggle is right now. Well, I feel very educated. <laughs> that actually was a really great overview. I feel like you definitely took us through all the different ones that I had question around. And I think people here in conversation and in talking about um, feminism. And I think Sean and I had some questions that we had, we had laid out. And I think you really defined the demarcation points between them. And I like how that, that was helpful to hear how standpoint kind of is between second and third and how it took us to, into a more intersectionality kind of approach. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about patriarchy, but I, I kind of feel like you covered it. So, yeah. So I guess in, in this kind of goes back to something you mentioned earlier, and I think it was when you were moving from talking about first wave to second wave, and you talked about consciousness raising, and you talked about um, just what it means to be an oppressed group, and that that there was an awareness that um, a lot of the women that were going around um, having their consciousness raised were, that there was just not an idea that that any of that was even happening. And, and it's kind of the way that, and it reminded me of how I think about the gender binary and how when I talk to people about my gender queer identity and that the, the, there's this consciousness raising just around that there's something beyond male and female and it sort of makes your brain explode and um, <laughs> people have to think about it. But I guess I just want you to say a little bit more about consciousness raising around being an oppressed group and I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what I'm trying to ask. Can you help me? No. Can you read my mind for me? There's just, there was something about the, how you said it and it was just like yeah, speaking, to, to like just that. speaking to the fact that there was not 
a lot of women didn't understand that that was even happening and mm -hmm. what it meant to understand that that was happening. Right. Well, I can talk a little bit about consciousness raising as a tool and about its strengths and its pitfalls. I can certainly talk about that, right? So the whole idea of consciousness raising um, was to get people who, I think at the time they would say people who shared an identity, and now, you know, third wave folks would say if you're going to organize, organize around a shared oppression, not particularly around a shared identity, right? Um, which I think is, I think that's one of those rubber hits the road points where it's like, oh, that is a way to do that. You know what I mean? Because it's like women and trans people and anybody along the gender continuum that doesn't identify as male can get on board with being oppressed around gender. Right. And you don't have to draw a picture that excludes someone. You know what I mean? Lots of people share a very similar oppression and their identities might might match or not. I mean, I think that's what you're saying, right? So, but regardless, so at the time they would have said people who shared an identity, but we could maybe imagine that it might be consciousness raising with folks who share an oppression, right? And that people get together and that the whole idea of um, oppression, when it's oppression from um, a dominant group or from sort of the patriarchy or some hegemonic status, right? Something that is like you know, not being able to, to see the forest for the trees, not fish not being able to see the water they swim in, right? So that in consciousness raising, people get together and share their experiences, their personal experiences. So it's a it's a, an empowering thing, right? And that through, I mean, this is a simplified explanation, of course, of consciousness raising, but that through hearing other people's experiences that ring true with yours, this thing that you thought was very personal you realize is not, right? I mean, that was the big slogan of the second wave, right? That the personal is political, right? And they didn't mean so much take your personal stuff and make it political. They meant these things that you think are personal are not. They are part of a larger thing, right? And we have all had that moment and we know how powerful it is, right? Around And, and you know, usually the things that you think are so personal, I mean, often you feel a lot of shame around them. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of... Um, and then you find out and you say, oh, I thought I was the only one. I didn't realize I wasn't the only one. And, and all of us, I think, have had that happen in different um, moments. And that is consciousness raising, where you didn't know before that this thing that might even feel like a terrible secret that you're carrying, right, is really a thing that's happening all over the place and how empowering that is. So that's the basic concept of consciousness raising. And certainly when it's done well, that's what it is. People sharing stories and growing a raised awareness as a result of the collectivity of their stories, right? Consciousness raising when it's done poorly is a little more like um, a lecture <laughs> to tell people about their oppression, right? And I and that is um, a strategy that backfires, right? And I think about, because I worked in the sexual violence movement, and so I can use it as an example, I think about all this um, push to tell women that something that happened to them was rape, right? When women will say, I don't know, it didn't feel like rape to me. I mean, it, maybe it wasn't good, but I think I know rape, and I don't think that's what it was, right? And people say, no, no, let me tell you, that's what it was, right? And the idea there, the intent, is to raise consciousness, is to say, sex that was forced on you is rape, right? But you that's not how people get their consciousness raised, is by being told <laughs> how they ought to interpret their own experience, right? Right. It doesn't work that way. So, um, and I think some of the critique of consciousness raising is because of the ways that it may have fallen into that. And you can imagine how it did, right? It was very powerful for you when you had your consciousness raised, and you would really <laughs> like to give that gift to that other person and help them understand. It's not like I have not, you know, made that mistake myself, right? So, <laughs> but as a tool, that's what it is. Um, and then what? I forgot the rest of your question. I'm sorry, Jesse. Okay. <laughs> What's the rest of your question? I think it was just like talking about. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. I guess I, it just reminds me of a really, really basic, not super shameful example, but I just remember, like, I don't really feel like it growing up, growing up female or whatever. I didn't really feel so oppressed, but I think when I was first getting my feminist lens, 
one of the things that really struck me was how much space men take up and like on the bus and that when you're walking down the street, like you're like, I'd be the one to get out of the way. And I definitely like thought that that was a personal thing. Like it was just maybe how I was and that I was always the first one to smile and, um, you know, just, and do those kinds of nurturing things. And then it's like, no, that's kind of like their dominant way of being in the world. It's like how they take up space. And it's like, from that moment on, I remember when I learned that, I was like, I'm going to take up as much fucking space as I possibly <laughs> can. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a good example. And I, and I think back on classrooms where I watch teachers try and say that to classes of people who just don't believe it because their consciousness wasn't, it wasn't raised and it didn't work to just say men talk a lot in a meeting and they always interrupt and they take, and people would say, no, 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 that's not true. It's just a personal thing. That person's just like that. Or they say, because no one wants to be the victim, who's lining up to be the victim? You know what I mean? They say, I take up a lot of space too. I can hold my own. Right. And it's because you can't, you can't just take people. Do you know what I mean? That's not how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But you, I have to be. Why don't you ask the next question? We're on. Well, do you want to just skip number four? And we covered five. We could go into gender stuff. Wait, we didn't talk about women only spaces. Okay. Mm-hmm. Buddy. Um. Spaces and it's used it to like totally. Uh, have you ever heard of? Um, we covered this person on our maybe fourth episode. They're called. Uh, they go by the dirt from dirt. Dirty mm-hmm. white boy. Mm-hmm. And it's this blogger that is like super anti-trans and actually pulls off YouTube and says these are the women that are so misled. Blah blah blah. And one of their blog posts. And I wish we had it. Does woman only spaces ode basically, mm-hmm. and like how um, to have queer spaces versus women only spaces, so for trans identified mm-hmm. or gender non conforming, that um, we're, they're losing power essentially. Like real lesbians and real dykes are losing power when they open up their spaces, and mm-hmm. really criticizes um, a lot of organizations that will open up to the trans community, like political organizations that will sponsor trans movements in addition, but then refer to themselves as a lesbian group mm-hmm. um so they do a bunch of do- blogging like, hey i was just t- telling her about that women only spaces remember dirty white boy the dirt from dirt that was going off on on women only spaces um i don't know it, it doesn't necessarily like move into this but like how that affects the trans masculine you want to talk about michigan women's fest or oh, what? yeah 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 okay. i can yeah. do it i just i read some blogs so about michigan women's fest in preparation around, though, like how do you like how does how would a contemporary, like, postmodern feminist be, is there a way to support those two camps where there's an ability for Mm -hmm. women empowerment Mm -hmm. as well as opening those spaces Mm -hmm. up to queer identified either um, trans women or by still being inclusive to female bodied history individuals that are now identifying as gender queer or or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a good question. Is that what we want to ask? I don't have the answer, but I'll talk about it. Uh, ask it. I think. I, mean, I think you I did. Think, I think I did. I think okay. you did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go there. God, there's no place I wouldn't go. Yeah. With this. Yeah. So the whole concept of women-only space is um, is a, I think it's an interesting one. So I think, um, and this is just what I think, right? This is so. Um, so um, there has there is a need, and and. Throughout history, oppressed people have identified the need for space where people who share an oppression and or an identity (laughs) can gather specifically free from (laughs) the people who do a lot of their oppressing, right? So that has been true for a long time, and um, anyone who has been a part of spaces like that recognize that there is um, a freedom in that kind of space that doesn't exist other places, right? So, and and radical feminists, that was sort of their whole tenet. Do you know what I mean? So, um, and there are a lot of um, people of color only spaces. I mean, it, it's not an uncommon thing to have happen, right? Um, 
the downfall to it in a general way is some of this downfall to identity politics because the groups are not organized around a shared oppression. They are organized around a shared identity. And then who decides who has what identity, right? Um, somebody decides unless you structure your group differently. Like I've certainly seen people structure their group where they are clear about who they invite and then they don't turn anyone away. Michigan Women's so, Festival, so that's what they do. So it's based on self-identification, but anybody can self-identify in. Right. So I have seen I have seen a lot of, um, recently I've seen a lot of folks manage it in that way, which has its pros and its cons also. And sometimes it's just a passive aggressive ploy, frankly, because... <laughs> Because then if someone comes who clearly doesn't belong, they're just ostracized, right? I mean, I've certainly seen that happen too, right? So, um... You mean like they're allowed, they're allowed in, but not included? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. I've seen it happen, right? Where folks are allowed in, but not welcomed and, and are ostracized, right? In the, in the conversation, their comments are not really, um, they're not valued, they're not paid attention to. The person is made to feel unwelcome so that they don't return. I mean, I'm just going to be frank. This is what I have seen happen um, so that groups can um, maintain the space that they're looking for but not be criticized as um, turning someone away. So being exclusive. think what you will about that. It is something that I have seen happen. So Michigan Women's Festival, very good example, right? So I was reading up on Michigan Women's Festival before I came just because I was like, I want to make sure I know what the current policy is, right? And I read a lot of really interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <Retail. laughs> yeah, right? So, and I went, I mean, I went to an all women's college, right? There was like mad talk about the Michigan Women's Festival all through my college years, right? But I have never been to it. I can never really forego. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I, I remember, of course, all, it, it's still happening now, but there was a, a time when there was this big explosion, right? Because there was the whole um, trans camp and set up outside and um, in protest, right? Against the um, women, women born women is what right. they say, right? And their stuff, right? Um, so, although they have no written policy exactly about what, who can come and who can't, and what they say is that it's a women-born women space and that they don't check gender at the door, right? And in fact, I read a blog post from a trans woman who goes there and works security there, right? She herself feels welcome there, right? So, um, and then I read a blog post from someone who said, that's a bunch of bullshit. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and went on to detail um, difficult experiences that they had had there, right? So I'm not trying to pick on Michigan Women's Festival. I'm just using them as an example because they are this very visible example of exactly this issue, right? And as come up, I've been watching it most recently, um, the same kind of idea around the Butch Voices Conference, right? Where there's been um, the Butch Voices Conference is um, a space for butch women, right? And so will it be a trans-inclusive space or not? And they have been really clear that it is a trans-inclusive mm -hmm. space, right? Um, and they have had a lot of pushback um, about that from other folks who feel like it shouldn't because I think, like you were mentioning earlier, there was this feeling like, um, like, like dykes are losing power. Do you know what I mean? Like to, that the, that the group is being um, diluted, sort of, if you will, right? And there's been some pretty, I mean, there's something there because that pushback is fierce. Mm -hmm. People don't just say, you know, it's not really the way I would prefer it. People right. get angry. They're angry, right? Well, and I feel like the whole conversation I was telling you about when we started today was in direct relation to that. And part of me just wonders, like, from a postmodern perspective, I guess, it's really, it's language and access to resources. Like, I feel like it would have been the same way 50 years ago if people had access to hormones and surgery if they wanted to have them and different language and having gone to the butch voices conference in portland and a whole workshop just on gender queer and everything that we talk about in this podcast like i guess i went to just the right workshop to feel good about my experience and we're going to go back in august and see sean you haven't been to one yet so it'll be interesting to see but i experienced it as a very trans inclusive right. space and using they and them, everybody that want, that I asked to use that did. Mm -hmm. 
and there was specific attention paid to pronouns. So if it was a woman only space, why would there be attention paid to pronouns? I'm well, rambling. I Sorry. <laughs> Wanda, if yeah, you got to get up to it. So I think that that points out two things. One of the benefits of, around, again, instead of congregating around an identity, congregating around oppression because gender nonconforming. I was a gender nonconforming person less than a year ago, and now I'm trans. Has my history or experience or voice <laughs> changed? Well, my voice tone has changed, but not what I have to say. So like they're they're losing out with that with that issue. But I also feel like in my own experience over the years. The pushback does tend to come, it's generational to some extent. I feel like the younger generation is much more flexible where I think part of that heat, when they come at the heat of needing that ownership, it comes out of the same thought process of, like say we had been talking about the second wave feminist, not understanding how the riot girl movement would embrace the word cunt because they had fought so hard to get away from that type of stuff. Just like the lesbian community empowering themselves to say, hey, we're we're here, we should, we deserve these equal rights and we are females and we like females, blah, blah, blah. I should, we should edit the no, blah, blah, blah. I don't say blah, blah, no. blah. I hate it when you say I always <laughs> edit it out, always edit it out. It just gives, Wait. it's just dismissive. So to say that you're cis female, is that what we what? <laughs> Our terminology changes like every week, so I'm like, are we saying cis female? You can say cis female, you can also yeah. say assigned female sex. So to say, you know, we're cis female and we love other cis females that sets us apart from the heterosexual world to have your camp all of a sudden say actually i don't identify as a female per you know i don't identify as female but then male it's the same pushback as we fought so hard to be as variant as we want and still identify as female it's hard to let go of the notion that wait but i want to not identify as that group and to both empower and let history of what do i want to say both to not necessarily take away from the movement and the power that you've gained over the last decade three decades but to realize that there are real differences within our community and let that be okay and just when you first started talking and you said just when you first started talking and you said you were gender con non-conforming and now you're trans like and this kind of gets back to what carrie said about organizing around an identity i do that like i'm victim of that or i'm a, a, a culprit of that too because i see the transgender identity the transgender movement the umbrella term encompassing all of us around anybody that's not cisgender, cis female identified. So for me, being gender nonconforming, I'm part of the transgender identity, which, God, it is. It's so <laughs> well, and I just like to say, too, that especially in this binary construct, sometimes your identity is not even only made up of who you are. So, like, I'm a lesbian. What if my partner transitions and becomes a man? Does that make me not a lesbian anymore? I mean, there are identity or that... transitions and because becomes not a woman. Well, then there's no word for me at all, right? Although I am the same person I have been. <laughs> Carrie, that's your word, <laughs> Carrie. <laughs> right, but I mean, I think it's what the it's that is the reason that lived experience led to the third wave and people saying identity is an unstable category, right? To organize around identity is folly in a lot of ways. But people feel very proud of their identities. Mm -hmm. And so to build a movement that allows for that pride and the empowerment that can come from identity while still recognizing the fluidity of people's own identities throughout their lifetime and the constructedness of them to begin with, that's the challenge. And, and just to totally oversimplify, but when you're just thinking language, it's much more sexy language to talk about identities in terms of like giving yourself labels and talking about all of the, these different identities that you have versus just saying, okay, I'm oppressed around gender. It's much more sexy to say, I'm gender queer, I'm gender nonconforming, I'm trans, I'm this, I'm that. And it's like, it's an ownership versus, it's like a positive thing versus a thing being done right. to you. I'm, yeah. I mean, I know that's probably oversimplifying, but right. it's just like the feeling of it. Well, and I'm not particularly proposing that people shouldn't have identities. I mean, I'm not going there. Some people would. Um, but I think identity can be very, um, I, I, I think it's good to have an identity that you're proud of. And, mm -hmm. and 
and you can, people can, I mean, people can do what they want for themselves, but I wouldn't be anti-identity, right? But I, I am a little anti the, the lines around, you know what I mean? The rigidity. Yeah. yeah. Right. The rigidity. Like, there should be a semi-permeable membrane. <laughs> to be able to be, I mean, it's the same, right? We have different identity labels as we go, just in age. You know, first year in yep. adolescence, then a teenager, and then finally you get to be an adult. And being able to embrace that and be able to, to point and say, this is what I'm what I am right now and I want to embrace these characteristics attributed to that label but realizing that just like everything else it's going to shift so not clinging that to that so hard that you can't be flexible and embrace others as they start so I think a really concrete question for me then is how do I call myself a daddy and call myself a boy or use male because I don't use male pronouns but I do use very male language sometimes like fag i call myself a faggot that's very like male driven language how how do i call myself those things yet not say that i'm um subscribing to or adding to or i don't know what's the right word the patriarchy um i'm not Good. subscribing to the patriarchy i know you're not asking me that question i have I no am. idea i have no idea how would i know I don't know. I mean, I, mean, that's what, yeah, right? so I think that's what we own, struggle with, though. Right? It's, it's our own individual work in carving out a label and defining what it means for us. And the only way we can do that as far as not matching up with the ideals of, of that world from a societal viewpoint is to educate. It's to say, I, I actually don't like this and this is what it means to me. Versus, oh, I have to comply with all these other roles because I use this word as well. So do you think that that just gets back at, like, essentialism versus... Well, I mean, I think, not to overly complicate it, but gender is a, is a complete fabrication in a lot of ways. Right. Not completely. I mean, I'm not, I'm not someone who's saying that it's completely constructed. The gender has some basis, but what gender is, what it means, how we do it, is, is reconstructed. It's performance. It. It's, it's performance, and it's, um, and we just, we've made a lot of it up, right? So... <laughs> Right? And so if you're going to make a lot of it up, why couldn't you be all those, what, what would it have to do with the patriarchy? I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily, none of those things. I mean, in its most constructed third wave sense, being a daddy might not have anything to do with maleness. It's its own discrete category. It's its own thing. It means its own thing, right? Um, but that, I think, is actually the work of folks who fall on the masculine spectrum is doing the work of pulling out of all of that male socialization so that you don't unintentionally reify it. I mean, that's everybody's gender work, right? Kind of reminds me of how we're trying to get away from gendering body parts and not gendering, like, saying that vaginas and breasts are female body types mm -hmm. of things. They're just vaginas and breasts in a body on a body. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of, I guess that gives me, like, the the physical example of what it is that you're saying and it makes a lot of sense yeah do you have anything else you this was so good oh my god i love this i want to talk for like 50 more hours um i we have the last question how are trans men i mean i really think we address a lot of the stuff that people are thinking and whenever i have conversations about feminism with anyone this is the stuff that comes up over and over again so um, as all of you are listening out there, you know, we're really curious what's coming up for you in terms of questions. And because Carrie is a good friend, I'm sure that we could um, convince her to come back or to help us answer some of those questions in a future podcast, even if it's just for a check-in. Hopefully she'll nod her head. She's smiling. So, <laughs> um, I guess I just have like one final question. And I think that this one was more um, posed by Sean, but... Um, it also was in a blog that we had recently read and posted on our Facebook page, and it was how uh, the no, I think it was Tranarchanism, Tranarchanism uh, blog. I thought it was Transfagatory. Oh, okay, yeah, it was the Trans Transfagatory blog that did the. Um, he did a post about how to be um, a good feminist and, and be a trans man, and he's identified as a trans man, I believe. So. Um, you know, not being trans yourself, I know that you're not going to have the, I guess, the in it kind of viewpoint. But I guess from a feminist perspective, though, um, how how can trans men, how can tra transgender identified people, even gender nonconforming people, be good feminists? What does that look like? I Am I just opening a can of worms? Question. The question is, can trans men, right? 
Yeah. You, you, okay, you go. Wait, no, I've been just... doing so much talking, Sean. It's your turn. Well, you just introduced the question for like 10 minutes, buddy. You should just finish your word. Just say, I think it's important to say like can because right, that's the okay. biggest, one of the biggest talking points. Is, is that even possible? And okay. then if so, like, what would that look like? Okay. <laughs> Does it? I mean, no, it's like, don't do it. Do it. Okay. So I think the first question that we're thinking about is, um, can, can trans men, trans identified men, or, or I guess, can members of the trans masculine okay, can, can members of the trans masculine community be good feminists? Are you selling that question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I, I don't want to be um, naive, but uh, anybody can be a good feminist. I mean, why couldn't anyone be a good feminist, right? I mean, I suppose it's a little like asking for a definition of sex. Like everyone would give you a different definition of what it means to be a feminist, right? But um, but if you imagine that in general, being a good feminist means working to improve and honor the lives of women, <laughs> which I'm just gonna go with as a basic definition, anybody can do that. And I would imagine that um, folks on the transmasculine spectrum would be in a particularly good place to do that, right? Because um, I, there are certainly sometimes well-intentioned people who intend to improve and honor the lives of women who hold rigid, stereotypical views of women, right? And they, the work that they might do may not actually be helpful. <laughs> so I would assume that folks who have, um, who have the, the, the lived experiences that folks on a transmasculine spectrum would have as related to gender would be in a particularly good place to be good feminists because the knowledge that you have is its own unique and useful body of knowledge that other people don't have. It should put you in a very good spot, I would think. That would be my, that would be my assumption and that would be my, my own personal experience in the world. That would be something I have seen to be true. I think that covered it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's your friend saying, or your whoever who said that they couldn't, that it couldn't I, happen? He said the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's just like basically, it, I mean, even this, the guy like, some of the women um, that make me the boy and stuff talking about basically. It's not the boy, it's just boy I am. The boy, boy. <laughs> it's just like, like lesbian feminists basically saying that trans men are hurting, like, are all of a sudden not feminists, and that they can't basically own their female history and or whatever. And it's based on the essentialist. It's very essentialist, and it's just all about you're adding now to the, you're becoming you're becoming yeah. the oppressor. You've jumped this camp did from this camp. Exactly, it's very black and white. We talked a lot about radical feminism, but I don't know if we talked. Did we talk exactly about what is the radical feminist rub with transness? Did we address that? No, exactly? let's address that now. I don't think we did. Okay, right? so let's. So how do I? How do I? I can just start talking transition about that from what you were just saying it yeah we'll feed it into the second wave when, when... or we can ask it now let's or we can ask it as a follow-up question so i think there's one more question that i'm i'm pretty curious about and it part of it is reflecting back on watching um boy i am which is a 2006 film so that sean and i just recently saw and um one of the things that we were thinking about is now i can't even freaking remember what the question was <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. So, what is the what is the rub? What is the conflict between radical feminists and trans people that are on the trans masculine spectrum? Yeah. No, it's a good question. It's a good question, and I think it's really useful to um, to understand because I think that the um, I think that understanding it points to to it's some of the underlying stuff around um, transphobia today, actually. So I think it is really useful to understand. So from a radical feminist perspective, if, um, if patriarchy is all consuming and evil, right? And it, it, you, we are all immersed in it. And the need then is to create new, totally create new spaces, women only, women run spaces so as to create a whole new way of being and a whole new body of knowledge in the world, right? Then, um, then I think it's interesting because I think the rub is different about, um, 
is is different the m to f and the f to m wrap i mean just to, mm -hmm. to shape it in that way is different right trans feminine versus trans masculine exactly right so um so the idea that they would that that um a, a, a radical separatist group would welcome in someone who had lived part of their life as a man they wouldn't do it right because the idea would be that that person had been already so socialized as a man that there's no getting away from that. Do you know what I mean? That the that the time that they had spent in that body and in that world had um, that they would not be able that they would essentially contaminate the space that they were coming into. Right, right. So that would be that rub, and the idea that someone who had lived their life as a woman who then transitioned or, or headed, I don't even know how far over into the trans masculine spectrum you would need to go, but the idea that you would do that would be seen as, um, as, as heresy. Like, why would you, like you were, like you were defecting. Do you know what I mean? Like you were leaving to join the oppressor, right? And so why would you do that? But it's interesting because those are two very different arguments, right? But I think both of those arguments are still at play today along with some other arguments about, um, that have to do with power, right? That have to do with um, feminist analysis of, um, of power that would say that it's perhaps women who um, are fall anywhere on the masculine spectrum are really, it's just really a power grab, right? That they're really just looking for um, masculine power and privilege, right? Some people might even um, have some sympathy for that and say, "Sure, right," but that, but that, do, but that doing it would be would show your own lack of heightened awareness about the patriarchy. That you know what I mean? That you just were headed into it, or that um, in a in a different way that um, women who that someone who had spent part of their life as a man, right? That the that the reason to sort of enter the woman's world would be a power grab in its own way. Do you know what I mean? There is this whole argument that um, sort of that people who were emasculated or that somehow couldn't make it as a man, do you know what I mean? Might um, be, I mean, sort of like a big fish in a small pond. Do you know what I mean? Might be able to um, have more status and be more accepted in that role. And I think all of those things were critiques within the radical feminist movement, and they are critiques that I still hear now, even if I don't hear them. Sometimes I hear them that clearly, and lots of times I think I just see them reflected in the in the specific kinds of transphobic comments that I hear. Do we want to end on that? Note? No, no, you're going to put well, that it's, further it's, it's back. Oh, yeah, but you should edit that back into the other yeah. part. You don't okay. have that at your end. Yeah. Okay. Also, because I did, a, I was like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I couldn't get it out. So, what was the wrap up? Um, you should do it. No, I don't know. You were going to talk about. Oh, relating current gender issues with older. Oh, I could say something about that. Yeah. You wanted to. Okay. So. Um, Sean and I really appreciate Carrie taking the time out of your busy schedule of being both a parent and a full-time professional, a parent of five, yeah. of five foster that you have adopted, foster to adopt kids. Um, so thank you. Did I say that wrong? <laughs> Details, buddy. I know. I'm a, I'm a micro kind of person sometimes. <laughs> anyway, Sean and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come here and talk with us about feminism. And this has been really, this has been really, really good. I'm, I can't wait to just sit and listen to it. But um, is there anything that we didn't cover, any sort of final thoughts or anything you'd like to add um, to kind of part with as, as we close out this session of, of I can't talk I'm like you today. <laughs> you don't like me. <laughs> this session of gender cast. You usually do that more than I do. Um, no, I think the only thing, the only kind of thought that I'm left with in my head is, um, I think that, um, I feel very excited by the gender movement in general. It seems to me, besides the fact that it's very exciting to me, um, because I have 
you know, thinking about all of the people I know who the movement genuinely benefits, right? Um, on a on a sort of a theoretical level, it's very exciting to me because um, for all of feminism's work on sexism and on even doing the work of separating sex and gender, gender as a category has been left relatively uninterrogated, really, throughout feminism, which seems a little bizarre to me, right? So, <laughs> so, so having a movement that that is more um, attuned to that issue, I think is exciting and can be really beneficial. And I see it really as the forefront right now, personally. So, and I am, and I really appreciate you bringing me on. And I, um, and what I hope is that um, thinking about some of the struggles and the challenges that feminism has had over history with this whole concept of identity and exclusion and where you draw the lines and what are the gains and how do you bring people in and what do you do when people have been left out, that, that all of this focus, especially on line drawing, right, and, um, and inclusion and exclusion and identity, I hope that, um, and I feel confident really, that the gender movement can learn from those past experiences and um, really just create a whole new template for us moving forward about how to do this in a better way and it will benefit feminism and really all of the other anti-oppression movements and I do think that the gender movement is the place that it will come from. And that's true, I do think that. <laughs> that was very awesome. Okay. <laughs> that will not be. That would be. Like, so as you talk about that, is there any, um, is there anything, is there any insight that you have into what, how the movement, how the movement can be successful? Like as far mm. as like, do you have any insight of things you absolutely think would be a good way for this movement to proceed, given what we've, where we've come from? Mm -hmm. Well, I have thoughts, but I just want to be clear that I'm not like the guru on organizing yeah. or on movements or whatever, right? But yeah, I mean, I have thoughts just from having watched things go down, you know what I mean? And from having, you know, studied my history, right? And I think that um, some of what we've been talking about, I think fo a focus on shared oppression with a celebration of identity, right? I think that is a good place to go. Um, I think that... Um, um, I think that there's a, I'm not even quite sure how to say it, but there's a, a there, I have seen in the queer movement in general something that I think is very promising, which is um, the, the need, this is part of why I think the gender movement is going to be able to do this, the need to create new things. And I just, as an example, I just think of um, the, locally the Northwest Network is a, a queer um domestic violence agency, right? And out, and they have a need to create a whole new assessment tool for when people call in and say that they're being battered because old tools are really predicated upon a heterosexual relationship and that worked because it was, um, so often it was men who were battering women, right? So in the absence of being able, in the absence of a man-woman relationship, a whole new tool had to be created which turned out to be a far better assessment <laughs> of a relationship. And that's the kind of thing I'm, I can imagine more of coming out of this movement, that, that in the need to invent new things because of the particular struggles, because of the language and the constructs just not being there, that, um, that this attention to, to detail and behavior and Items. Do you know what I mean? Instead of a, a reliance on an easily available construct. Like male I, and female. Like male and female, but like who knows what else. I mean, our whole life is made up of easily available constructs. Do you know what I mean? There's a million of them. So I think the, the more that people are able to do that, I mean, the learning that can come out of that is amazing. It's, a, it's a shocking. Do you know what I mean? So um, that's what I think that this movement might be able to do. And I, and I think just just being a, very aware that it's hard to know what our own assumptions are and being open to, to feedback and criticism and hearing angry voices that seem really unreasonable and trying to listen for what's going on there. I think all of those things are things that I have seen folks do that seem to genuinely 
strengthen a movement. Those are suggestions that I have. I don't know if that's the kind of thing you were looking yeah. for. Yeah. 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 So, I'm going to lean in. I'd say I'm feminism 101. Yeah, and I think I called it. I'm going to do the roots of feminism. What, cookie? Not a cookie. What? Well, I gave her a cookie and then she's made her talk. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that wraps up episode nine on Feminism 101, Roots and Foundation for the Gender Movement. Thanks again for coming on the show. And um, it was a great experience, and I, I hope to uh, generate a lot of discussion from you listeners out there um, about your thoughts and feedback about this. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Awesome. That was yay. Yes. That yay. was really fun. Is that what you wanted? Yes. yes. Yeah? Absolutely. Okay. I, I think it was more of what I wanted than I even knew. Yeah? <laughs> So welcome to uh, episode nine check-ins. And the first one we're going to do is Tranacy Land. We had a friend of mine get um, on his receipt. He was given a he was getting his coffee and was given um, with his change. He had a <laughs> so a friend of mine was getting his coffee, his morning coffee, and when the barista handed him his change. He handed him uh, a receipt with his change, and on the back of the receipt had written, I'm trans, and it just totally made uh, my friend's day, and we're going to post a picture of what of the receipt that he took, and I just thought that that was a cool kind of Tranacy land come true in real, real land. I think it's always cool to acknowledge that we're visible sometimes, even if it's to our own little secret posse, <laughs> and the fact that it was on this back of the receipt, it's kind of like... This Mission Impossible crew <laughs> meet me at seven o'clock. You know, like it's just funny. So awesome, and just a random event we did. That's probably pretty cool. So our next one will be quotes from the binary. So I just want to give a shout out to one of our listeners who has. We've actually, I think, um, aired something on another show. Ryan is their name, and they're in Arizona, and they've been really good about writing in with questions or feedback. And one of the cool pictures that we got, we posted on our Facebook page, and it's from this bakery company called French Meadow Bakery. And it's hilarious because the picture is two loaves of bread that are side by side. And one says man's bread and the other one says woman's bread. And what's more hilarious about this is when you go to their website, it says one body, one planet. But obviously they're acknowledging that even when it comes down to bread, it has to be in the binary. Um, so check it out. It's a good laugh. And yeah, that's what else is there to say? Really? Really, we're talking about carbohydrates here. <laughs> okay, so our next check-in will be local events, and we just wanted to start getting um, talking about pride. But before we do that, um, there is a blow pony on May 28th at Rocher in Portland, and there is the Lick Queer Party here in Seattle on June 4th, and that will be at Chop Suey. And then um, I want to just mention that Portland Pride, for those of you in the Pacific Northwest, is the weekend of June 17th, uh, June 17th through the 19th. So that's a couple weeks before the big Pride weekend circuit of when like Seattle and San Francisco and New York and all the big Prides happen. So Sean and I are actually trying to plan um, to be down in Portland for Pride and hopefully handing out some flyers and getting some more exposure down in Portland for GenderCast. Um, after Portland Pride, we'll be, uh, both Sean and I will be staying here in Seattle for Seattle Pride, and that's the weekend of June 25th, so it's June 25th and 26th, and June 25th, all the events will be up on Capitol Hill, which is the queer area of Seattle, and we have our Broadway Street Festival, and we're hoping to have a booth for GenderCast. And then Sunday is the big Pride Parade and um, huge Pride Festival down in Seattle Center, which is um, an event that moved down that way a, a couple years back and is just huge for Seattle. So um, did you have anything you wanted to add around? So we're also going to be a part of this uh, run and walk with pride. The beneficiary this year is $3 Bill Cinema, who brings us both the Lesbian and Gay Film Festival, uh, Movies in the Park, uh, but also the Trans Festival. And so 
we were a part of that this weekend, and we wanted to support them. And um, based on some good advice of, from a friend, we're, we just have recently met with a uh, graphic designer, Ray, who's been really awesome and generous about donating their talents and time to possibly getting us a logo. And we'll see how the process works out, but we're hoping to have T-shirts. And so we'd probably be there with a few of us wearing the GenderCast T-shirts. Gender is important to me. Gender is important to me. Yeah, so <laughs> edit. Wait, I thought it was a 12th. Oh, no, that's our no. 100 day. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's just talk about it instead of promoting it that we're going to be there. Let's okay. just talk about it as an event. So, so also the same week of the Portland Pride, for those of you that aren't attending the Portland Pride or are here in Seattle, there's going to be an awesome um, run and walk with Pride. It's a 4K or 10K run slash walk. Uh, Seattle Front Runners is the one that's putting it on, and the beneficiary this year is $3 Bill Cinema, uh, which we've promoted in the past. They're the, the awesome organization that gives us – the Translation Film Festival, as well as the Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. They also do the awesome movies in the park here in the summer, which I'm really looking forward to. So if you're in town, definitely uh, sign up for that. They have um, both a student discount, and I think it's like $10 and then 15 if you're not a student. So it's certainly feasible and, again, a great organization to be a part of, and it sounds like fun. So, And the Seattle Front Runners is trying to be more inclusive of other um, – folks this year besides their primary group, which are um, gay men. So they're trying to be more inclusive to both the gender community and lesbians. So um, if you look at, if you wind up running across their flyer, you'll see lots of words on the front of their flyer that um, promote the community that they're trying to be inclusive in. And um, just a shout out to Ruben, who was in my leadership training with me, and he actually did the flyer with them. So uh, Ruben and Nicole from my out in front leadership training wound up working with Seattle front runners. And so they're just a running, not just, but they're a, a group here in Seattle. That's a group of, um, people that are queer identified that get together and run. And so like Sean said, their nonprofit that they chose to ha- be the beneficiary for this year's big, uh, run and walk with pride is $3 bill cinema. And just as far as, a. Uh Heads up, uh, things to be looking forward to that we're really excited about is one, we talked briefly last time about the Queer Mixer. I think we really have chosen the spot to be Liberty Cafe, which is in Capitol Hill. It's on 15th. We went and checked out the spot. They have some decent food and wine. Uh, they have some decent, uh, mm. they have a decent food menu as well as uh, alcoholic beverages and coffee that they serve there and a private room that we'll be able to kind of meet in. So we're We're looking forward to organizing with them. I think at this point we're looking at the weekend of the 12th, so meeting. uh, So I I think at this point we've nailed it down to uh, trying to reserve the room for June 12th, which is the second weekend in June. It'll be on a Sunday uh, and sometime in the afternoon, so hopefully um, you know, we can kind of put faces to listeners and and get everybody in one room to kind of mingle. And we're also really excited. We just met with Ray. A graphic designer here who's generously donated their time and talents to helping us uh, kind of brand and get a logo so that we can um, pass out flyers when we're on panels or doing stuff within the community like going to Pride. Uh, so we're really looking forward to getting some t-shirts made so um, we can wear those to events as well as, uh, you know, use them as a fundraising tool. So be looking for that. There is also... Stuff? No, no. There's also this really great um, local website, uh, Trans FTM Washington State. It's a group on Facebook that you can um, sign up for. They, I've been, they're another organization here that's organized by a friend of mine that's just trying to get the community to, to mingle and meet each other. Uh, they're looking at organizing camping trips and hiking trips, uh, as well as just uh, looking at different ways to do some activism. There's some some talk right now around uh, different terminology um, and. That we, that medi- um, different terminology within the medical community and stuff. So it's another organization if you live up here in the Northwest and you want to meet other trans guys, it's a good way to um, meet up on Facebook first. So for our final check-in, we just want to talk about Becoming Chaz, which was the opening night movie for um, our translations, which was the Seattle Transgender Film Festival. And I, we actually saw some other really good films um, that we may be talking about in the future, but we're going to focus in on Becoming Chaz because this one had a lot of controversy surrounding it. So 
Um, I have lots of opinion about becoming Chaz and, um, yeah, I don't even know where to start. Uh, of course, um, I think we need to mention that, you know, for me, it felt like a very similar trans narrative that I've heard a million times over. There was definitely a huge focus on hormones, him going on hormones, and then a large focus on his top surgery. You want to go first, then we can no, cut I think out we that just part. Say, like, you know, bring what you want about the movie. You bring anything you can up when you uh, talk about it. So just uh, say what you want. And make your life simple. Not as much as you can on all the hate you have. So remember to talk about I'm just trying to give like a little intro to it, and then I thought we could go into it more together. No. Okay. So <laughs> far. Okay, so for our final check-in, we want to reflect upon Becoming Chaz, which was a film that was shown at the Seattle Translations, which is our transgender film festival. And um, just to start, you know, some initial, definitely have some opinions about the film, some initial uh, reactions that I have around the film was it was very um, rooted in the privilege that Chaz has being the son of Cher, um, the, the offspring of, or child of Cher. And, um, you know, of course, is a white, you know, white person of privilege. And so just no acknowledgement of privilege or privilege in class or race and ability, just no acknowledgement of that, that he, you know, has access to hormones, that he has access to surgery. And then the other big piece for me was just, I found myself throughout the film just thinking, what else? And it was just so focused in on the same trans narrative, you know, that we always see that I just, I didn't see a lot getting at his human beingness. He talked about having some history in um, a 12 step program for addiction issues. And that was really the only point in the movie where I was like, oh, okay, here's something else. And then sort of my final <clears throat> issue with the film was no acknowledgement of any kind of gender fluidity or gender nonconforming identity or just way of being in the world and that it was very binary focused it was like he was talked about as a woman as chastity and then and then he was a man as Chaz and there was no even fluidity in between as he was first going on hormones they didn't even acknowledge fluidity there and then it was just so sensationalistic around the pictures and I think that gets into some stuff that you wanted to talk about so again like we said there's been Lots of dialogue online, on Facebook, in regards to the hype around this. One, the documentary, but also the interview on Oprah. And first, I want to say, you know, yes, it is brave. It is something that takes some guts um, to kind of put it all out there for random people to see. Uh, and you don't know how it's going to, do pe to be perceived or what kind of feedback you're going to get. So I do give him props for sharing his story especially, you know, again, what Jesse said as far as having privilege and access to Oprah and these places is based on his celebrity fame, not so much on the fact that he's transitioning, but knowing that it does take some guts to go and kind of just like, you know, put your whole life out there and your relationship dynamics and stuff like that. So I, I want to start with giving him a little bit of credit for that. The other thing that came up for me just as a newly transitioning guy is the homework I feel like wasn't done – the homework around what obstacles our community struggles with just wasn't done. And I feel like if you're going to be an activist, a very visible activist, you have to do your due diligence and examine the community. I know he talks about how he's volunteering with these kids, but really having no, again, no, what one, there was no dialogue in the movie about how he's been perceived by the world. Like there's no discussion around, yeah, I went to the market the other day and the person called me she and it made me feel this. So no real di dialogue about what it feels like to transition and experiences that we you'll see on YouTube where people talk about that. So again, getting at what Jesse said, there wasn't really any like personal connection besides the medical transition. And that's something that we always see is the sensationalism around the body changing. So the hormones as well as the, the top surgery and stuff like that. It did it, it pictured that like we've seen a million times. So that wasn't nothing, well that wasn't anything new to our community, but certainly 
if you're going to be talking to a community that has no knowledge of the trans community, I feel like it's really important to express the obstacles that a lot of our community struggle with. It's your due diligence to uh, volunteer with more than one e organization or at least go to, I don't know, a workshop or educate yourself on the fact that class does play an important role. Race does play an important role around transition. Not all of us, you know, a lot of us struggle with having access to hormones or having um, the financial means to do top surgery several years on hormones and how that feels and stuff like that. So I feel like if you're going to bring this topic, you really need to bring it in a well-rounded way so that you, one, advocate for our community, but also present a real picture, not just, oh, yeah, I did this. It was so easy. I just, you know, went to the doctor and bam, it's like taking a, you know, I woke up the next morning and ta-da, I'm a man. So really having no no depiction of the process or what was happening internally with him. That was definitely something that I felt was lacking. Yeah, I agree. And I definitely understand that it's one person's narrative, one person's trans narrative. But because of his position of fame and, you know, that most, you know, everybody knows who Cher is. Who doesn't know who Cher is, right? And um, Especially in the queer community, who right, doesn't know? Right. And I'm not even going to get into her bobbling around with pronouns, which was unfortunate and painful, actually, to watch. Um, but in that he is coming from such a powerful position, I just feel like he really did a disservice to the community and where we've tried to come in the last five or so years with there not being such a focus on hormones and not such a focus on surgery and what it really means to be trans, you know, you're only capturing a small part of the, you know, or at least not a small part, but you're capturing a part of the community when you talk about his story and you're leaving out a whole entire other part of the community that either doesn't have access to hormones and surgery or doesn't want to have hormones and surgery, but we still consider ourselves trans. And I think, you know, part of why we even do this podcast is to tell both ends of that spectrum. And I know that we miss and leave out some, you know, narratives or identities or, you know, however you want to perspectives. I know we leave out some perspectives, but um, I think we're, we're at least getting at the two extremes. <laughs> and I know that that's a lot of responsibility for one film or one person, but for this film to be, to be made in 2010 and be shown in 2011, it just seems like, ha you know, half the community was left out. And that for me was painful to watch. And again, a real absence of educating the general public, which is based on his fame, what is the audience that he's approaching is what it i mean did he pass right away what was what did that look like as far as did he have did he struggle with um his relationship and the dynamics of being called the wrong pronoun for a while like just no kind of reflection of what real turmoil or issues he was having and yes i know my identity but how is that perceived out in the world and what do i have to deal with and that being a real a real opportunity that that was missed on educating people like yeah we're moving through this world all the time and this is what it's like so bringing that awareness to the table and then the other thing i really disliked and maybe it's my own sensitivity because i feel like when i acknowledged that i was going to start taking hormones there were some people that immediately had this reaction and that's the testosterone equals more aggression or bad behavior and i feel like there was a couple of times where either his partner or Chaz was talking around um, the very differences between having these hormones and what that makes you do. And just feeling like for so long, the cis male community has been able to, you know, has been able to rectify their bad behavior or their inability to communicate or their inability to work on their communication um, or expressing themselves uh, based on the fact that they have testosterone and they're males. So to have someone that has a history that we do and start to inject this hormone in our body and then excuse once again bad behavior or your inability to you know, take a step back and have a, a, a calm dialogue versus just reacting and, and being angry or whatever, that is a personal choice. That is not related to hormones. But this film, I, I think, didn't express that very well and it basically made an excuse for for Chaz's lack of either intimacy or emotional connection or ability to express his emotions in a more healthy kind of way by the fact that he was on tes testosterone and both that that came from both his partner and his own dialogue and I just really felt like again a disservice and people have that 
that perspective already around hormones and what testosterone is and what it does to you and does to your mental, uh, emotional expression and all of these things. And I just feel like it perpetuates the myth versus really getting at, like, I actually was kind of a reactionary person prior to this, and now testosterone is also in my body, but that wasn't, they're two separate events. It's not that testosterone is, is affecting my communication skills. So we're really interested in hearing from all of you that as you're able to see the movie, I know it's on the um, Oprah Network, and I'm sure some other film festivals are going to be showing it as well. So please write in at gendercast at gmail.com um, your impressions of the film, and we'll revisit this. And this wraps up our check-ins for Episode 9 and wraps up Episode 9. Thanks. See you guys. Copyright 2012, Gendercast, our transmasculine gender query. All podcasts, content, and information related to these podcasts are the property of Gendercast producers and may not be used without their written consent. Contact Gendercast at gmail.com for written permission. I am just one into this world, but what the world might see isn't always me. Cause inside is a boy trying to break free. He doesn't want to take over my body or my soul He just wants to share this body, make me whole Cause the girl this world does see is only half of me surface you will find the million thoughts that cross my mind I am born into this world brand new strong with knowledge small takes time to learn it all time to live leave it all behind Except the different and find the peace of mind Differences make us who we are and what we know Some of us are scared to let it show Let it out, scream, this is me Now it's time that the whole world see Cross my mind, a million paths that can unwind.